This is how 23-year-old Devere Fisher ended up nearly losing his life in Gaza, but instead experienced a miracle. Devere Fisher, who's from the Jerusalem area, served in the IDF as a combat medic. Like many Israelis who go to travel after their army service, Devere went on a trip to India and Nepal. But what happened while he was on the trip was something he never expected. I went to get something to eat, and on the way there, I saw a friend of mine uh, who was like coming and said, uh, did, you, did you hear what happened? I said, uh, no. What do you mean? Where? Um, and then he said, in Israel, there was a party, uh, and about 100 people are dead. There are a couple hostages, and they took over a base, the terrorists. And I opened the news, and I started also to see the videos, all the brutality and the murders and the rape. And I said, like, you know, I can't stay here. I felt like reality is crushing on me. And then I said, you know, I have to go back as a Jew and an Israeli. And, so I'm like, and like, I'm a descendant also to Holocaust survivors from both my sides. So the, it's something that is really present in my life. And like seeing those videos and hearing what happened is something like I said, like this is like stuff that happened in the Holocaust. And this time we have an army and I am a combat soldier. I have to go back and fight them. So I did. I decided I go tomorrow. At night I saw like seven shooting stars in like five, ten minutes. And it's kind of like a sign for me uh, that I'm like protected. But I felt like something is going to happen to me. I landed on Saturday morning and I drafted on Sunday. And I joined my, my unit on Monday and we trained because again, it was my first reserves duty. So like I did, we can, uh, didn't really know the platoon, like the, the older guys. So it was like, you know, getting to know them, like we're going to go into Gaza with you. And as something like to, first of all, to get to know people and like you're a little bored during those training times, you know, before you go because you don't know what's going to happen. So I was doing, uh, I was teaching them yoga, doing yoga next to like tons of ammunition and guns and rockets. <laughs> it was like really surrealistic thing. We got into Gaza by foot. I think at the night between October to November, 31 first of November, we got into Bet Hanun, which is the northest city in Gaza. It was a scary walk. We walked for like seven, eight kilometers and it was scary and the bag was heavy. During those times, you know, your mind is running thoughts. So I was like, I'm doing it for my family and I'm doing it for my friends and for my life and for my country and just for something that is bigger than me. Like I may be walking now as one soldier, but I really, I really felt like the power of, of the whole Jewish nation behind me. And like, I'm doing this to protect, like, you know, we said never again. And like, this is really why I did this. Um, so this kind of like got me through the night. So we got into Bet Hanun at, uh, I don't know, like at the beginning of the morning, we had some missions. Our whole mission was to conquer the area take out terrorists, if we see, and like uh, ammunition, rockets, anything that could use into terror attacks uh, to clean it out. We did it for eight days. The whole scenarios in Gaza are also like a little scary, you know, because you, you have threats from everywhere. You have tunnels, you don't know where they'll come. You have tunnels, you have snipers who could snipe you. You have RPGs, you have drones that could just drop grenades. So like the threat is from everywhere. Uh, so you're like in constant stress, you barely sleep for like, you know, you sleep two, three hours and then you have something to do. If it's to guard or to go on a mission. On November 8th, um, we were on our way to an attack on a, on a UN school, UNRWA, which operated as a Hamas base. They were shooting rockets from there and they were hiding ammunition there. So our mission was to uh, take control of this area. Again, because of all the threats, you're not just like, you know, casually walking. So you'd be running from place to place uh, in pairs. We were just moving between two houses with like, they had like about like 30 feet of a road, like 10 meters, something like that. So we started to run, then we hear tak, 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 like uh, bullets. And I really felt the air just like cutting right next to me because the bullet hit the wall next to me. I continued on running after understanding, you know, and all this is, this is a matter of seconds. And I'm standing, I'm being shot at. And like two, three meters before I entered the house, I suddenly just, I see black. I felt like, you know, ringing in my eyes and like extreme pain, like stabbing your toe at night, you know, that you have something out of nowhere times like a billion. I saw everything from above. 
like from a drone. Um, like the whole situation, I was here, my friend was here with the tank, the area, and like just for, you know, a split second, but I, it's something that is like carved in my memory. And then I just felt like I'm going back into my body. I fell down and I had lost conscience for like 30 seconds. In this time, like my friend like covered me, two other guys pulled me from my vest into the house which is a feeling I do remember. Then I kind of like, you know, woke up, asked him like, what happened, what happened? And I was like in extreme pain. And they started treating me. They started doing pecking, which is like stuffing the wound with bandages to stop the bleeding. And I felt the pain like centers and in, like into here. And like, I saw them doing the pecking here. So I said, you know, I was shot in the neck. It's a scary thing to understand. And after that, they started to like undress me and like take out my, you know, my helmet, my clothes and my earbuds as well. Um, and I said, like, you know, this is, this is like just so scary. And like, I don't want to be here. I want to disconnect and I'm conscious and I'm in pain and just want to disconnect. And that's why I said, uh, the mantra I do always for meditation. So I just, instead, I kind of did a meditation. So I just did it over again. Like, Om Mani Padme Hom, Om Mani Padme Hom, Om Mani Padme Hom, Om Mani Padme Hom. And the medic next, like who was treating me still, he's asking me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing a mantra for me that I learned in India. I said, okay, good, stay conscious. The evacuation was pretty quick. And the doctor came to me and said, like, I'm going to have to like sedate you. After that in the hospital with my whole family around my bed. But then they explained to me like what a miracle happened because the bullet came in from here, went out of here, through my neck without hitting anything critical to life. It did hit the edge of my vertebra of C6. Uh, that causes some like uh, nerve pain in my hands and legs sometimes uh, but it didn't hit any of the main arteries or you know any of the other pipes we have in the neck and we have so many so it was like the doctor told me like if i have to sit now with you on a, an atomic map of the neck and like try to draw a route for a bullet to go through i wouldn't be able to do that better than this bullet so it's like he said it's like something it's one to a million, is that something like that happens. I was in the hospital just for one week and they let me go. On October 8th, I heard what happened and on November 8th, I was injured. Oh, and another sign. Uh, so I was, I was injured on Wednesday. On Tuesday night, we did another mission and then I saw again like four or five shooting stars at night. And I said, like, this is, this is another, like, it reminded me, I said, like, this is like what happened in Nepal. And 12 hours later, this miracle happened to me. Since Devere's miracle, he's been on a road to recovery, both physically and mentally. Something so rare and like special happened to me. There has to be some kind of reason and for me to live and I have to find that. So I bought a microphone and I started a podcast that I interview other soldiers and not only soldiers who got injured physically and emotionally by the war. And I tell them stories, I, like I interview them, I hear out there. I hear, I, first of all, I hear how they got injured and then how they feel after it and how they recover. And because I feel it's something that we don't get to hear about. Deville has also found a community to recover with here at the Brothers for Life house. Brothers for Life came into the hospital room I was in. First of all, they look different. Both of them had prosthetic legs. And they said, we're a foundation, we were in your place as well. And we want to invite you into this community and this family. And we want you to know there is a community for people who are just like you, who got injured in combat. And it's like a really good bond because I feel you can really, really bond with someone who has been through stuff like you. Is there anything you'd share with somebody who is also navigating their own path to recovery after a traumatic experience? that it will take time. So don't expect like to wake up one morning and everything will be fine. Like I wish, but it's not realistic. So we have to stay patient, but it's something that you'll grow out of and you'll find so much strength within yourself. It will lead you to places you didn't think you'd get to. Like if you asked me a year ago, I wouldn't think I'd be like, you know, having a podcast or I don't know, interviewing people or like getting interviewed by myself. Uh, it's something like, you know, life, life leads you and, and let it lead you, you know, because really good stuff are coming.